Welcome to Dominate Your Day podcast. This is the podcast that adds value to leaders who want to make a difference in the workplace. We believe each person is unique and has a purpose they can live out every day and make an impact in the world. Here at Dominate Your Day podcast, we hear stories from leaders who have used their unique talents to transform themselves and their companies from the inside out. So welcome to Dominate Your Day. Today I have a really special guest that has made a huge difference, I believe, in the world in what he's done. And I'd like to introduce you to Steve Tang, also known as Stephen Tang. Steve, welcome to the show. Dana, it's wonderful to be with you. Yeah, I just, in our time together, a brief time this morning, I've been so impressed with your story and I wanna make sure that our difference makers that are here listening on Dominate Your Day hear what your story has been and how you've come from immigrant to uh, chairman, CEO, founder, business civic leader, just a person of dignity and personal humility who's making a difference right now. So welcome to the show and tell us your story. Well, it's great to be here, Dana. Um, I am the son of Chinese immigrants, came to this country from um, the war in China in the 40s and 50s. Um, my parents met here. Uh, I was born in Madison, Wisconsin, raised in Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, spent a little of my time in Beaumont, Texas for a year, actually. Oh, okay. Uh, here in Texas. And, and in Texas, right. yes. Yeah, and a wonderful place. Um, yeah. Grew up as an outsider. Um, mm. Much of my life being the only kid of color in my grade. Uh, but my parents were determined to raise us as all American kids. So we learned mm. things, um, how to learn and appreciate music and sports and school, um, you know, work hard, be self-determined. All those things are, were very important in my upbringing. Um, I went to school, I uh, have undergraduate degree in chemistry, PhD in chemical engineering, and MBA from the Wharton School. So higher education had a big place in our life too. But, you know, beyond that, I think it was uh, a life lifelong learner. The degrees are important, but they're not the only thing I learned along the way. Uh, and, and I've been able to have opportunities to be in high growth situations with companies um, where my responsibilities and roles expanded very quickly. Um, I think that's one of the keys I'd say is to success is get yourself in a high growth situation because you'll learn a lot and get to do a lot of things very quickly. And then looking back on my life uh, now at uh, 63 going on 64 years old, uh, I've been fortunate to have the title of ch uh, Chief Executive Officer and Chairman of the Board for uh, over 30 combined years. Uh, so I've had a lot of roles in the for-profit setting, the non-profit setting, um, that involve uh, the life sciences, uh, specifically medical diagnostics. Um, I've been involved in uh, global public health initiatives, let's say to eradicate HIV, uh, in Ebola, uh, now working as chairman of the board of a company called Now Diagnostics, uh, which is trying to uh, eradicate syphilis, which has been spiking throughout the world these days. Mm. Um, so a lot of places where health disparities um, are expressing themselves and there's really human tragedy around them. Uh, I've been involved in those situations. Uh, I'm also a trustee at uh, uh, two universities, uh, so higher education has been my passion as well. Um, but just giving back in general. I think at this stage of my life, um, I'm here to serve. I'm here to, uh, to share my experience, um, uh, share my failures along the way to, mm -hmm. help, to help, I think, leaders get real about their own mm -hmm. lives and uh, situations. And, you know, Dana, we've been through a lot with the pandemic uh, mm -hmm. over the last four years. Uh, and we're in that awkward time where nobody quite knows where we're going. Are we out of it? Are we still in it? What do we do about it? What about these return to office mandates? What about hybrid work? All those things are kind of baffling. And I think it requires leaders to think differently about their careers and how they work with people um, and how they become better, stronger, more resilient people and cultivate in others uh, that same sense of development. Okay, what an amazing story. So there was a lot of, lot of meat in there. I want to start with you, you were having to face a lot of obstacles as a child, as, as you grew an adult, as like you said, you were an outsider. 
I'm curious. You know your unique Clifton strengths. What do you think, and you haven't told us those yet, what do you think it was back then that was helping you get through that time, decide to get into sciences and your master's of business? What what do you think that was in your in your strengths? Well, hard work gives you confidence. And I think right. that once once you have learned to overcome over and over again, I think that's the definition of resilience. I also think right. it's a definition of, of faith. I think that you have to, to, to have something to base your faith in yourself on. And mm -hmm. if you put yourself in situations where failure is a real possibility and you've overcome those and so you've succeeded, you know, that gives you the strength um, to know yourself mm -hmm. and know what you're good at. Um, and once you know how to bring out the best in yourself, you know how to bring out the best in other people as well. So I think there's something very contagious about learning about yourself and then translating that uh, to leading people. Um, and I'm, I'm a believer that leaders ought to be cultivating strengths in the people that they lead and they ought to be interviewing mm -hmm. for those, those attributes. Um, mm -hmm. But they're things that you cannot learn. You can't learn character issues. You know, you've got to have high integrity. You've got to do what you say you're going to do. You have to have a track record of doing so and getting along with people. Um, the rest can be taught. The skill part is, can, can be right. taught. But the character issues, the self-awareness, um, the self-realization, actualization, all those things are important for um, that come out in Strengths Finder and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and by the way, I happen to believe that in this world of AI that we're living in right now, yes. uh, I, think, I think AI will help people um, overcome their weaknesses even better because the computer will be able to do some of the thinking for you. And that puts even more of the emphasis on your strengths. So I think that uh, uh, leading through strengths and having good diagnostics like the Strength Finder will ultimately help leaders and help everyone be better people. I think that, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. And I think it's that you can feel when somebody's not feeling uh, confident. And there's a lot of people out there as leaders right now not feeling confident in the workplace because there's so much change going on. Things are completely sure. different. We'll get into that in a minute with your book and, and what why you wrote your book. But I think part of that is is doing that deep work inside and how important that is to know what those talents are as you're working with AI, as you're leading teams, as you're managing change, as you're leading a board, um, and, and what that looks like. So I appreciate you bringing that up. So let's talk a little bit. How, why did you get into sciences? Was there somebody or a mentor or somebody in your path that said, hey, you should get into the sciences? What, you know, in higher ed, what, what, who was that? Well, I was raised by two scientists. Uh, well, my there mother, we go. My mother uh, uh, was a medical technologist, taught clinical chemistry at the University of Delaware. Uh, my father was a research chemical engineer with the DuPont Company. Uh, did a lot of work in aerospace. Uh, he uh, was awarded posthumously the NASA Lifetime Achievement Award. So, um, yeah. so I grew up in a in, in a household that that valued science um, and valued logical thinking and everything that goes into it. So that was that was readily available to me. Um, did you, did you know when you got into the sciences you were going to be creating something for such a time as this during the pandemic? I had no idea. Home test. Yeah. No, and, and, in, and in fact, um, science did not come easy to me. I did it because it was expected of me. Um, mm -hmm. But I really didn't hit my stride until I was in business school at the Wharton School for my MBA. And I found that um, my passion was leadership. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, there's a science behind leadership, no doubt about that. Absolutely, but I, yeah. And there's also an art to it. And so I think I, uh, this is where the, the continuous learning comes in, all right? So to me, um, being a leader in science-based industries like life sciences doesn't mean you're an advocate for science. It means cultivating a balanced view of the world and you know what decisions need to be made and what sort of investments need to be made and what sort of people need to be nurtured. So it's it's a rounding effort, I think, in, in becoming more human, with an appreciation towards the sciences and engineering, uh, but there were many, there there were many and are many scientists and engineers who are much more talented than than I was when I was in those fields, and so um, I had to find my own way, and it was really through 
studying and practicing um, you know, leadership traits. So coming out of getting your science degrees and then saying, you know, I really want to get into business school. What, what was that? How did that happen? Was that, was that somebody else that came along or was that your, your, your just desire to say, I've got to learn more. I've got to get, I've got to figure this out. Well, I went to grad school back in 1982. Um, and as I started the program, uh, my father, who was only 54 years old, died of cancer. And uh, so that was a great, great devastating loss in my life. And uh, I got to know the man who became my PhD advisor, um, who actually has become my surrogate father. Uh, his name is Arthur Humphrey. Mm -hmm. He was the provost at Lehigh University. Uh, he, I'm still very close to him. I named my son after him. Uh, he's, mm -hmm. uh, he's 97 years old and I'm still very close to him and um, attribute a lot of my grounding not only in science and engineering but the management of people through Arthur. So Arthur said to me after I got my PhD, he said, you know, you, you are really good at leading people, which I think was a euphemism for you're not that great an engineer, you ought to find something <laughs> else to do. Um, so he steered me to the University of Pennsylvania in, in Wharton's executive MBA program. So it's, it's the value of mentorship Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's the value of being mentored. And, you know, I love the saying, you know, when the student is ready, the teacher appears because yes. Arthur came into my life exactly at the time where I needed someone, you know, as he, he and I share with each other, I didn't have a father, he didn't have a son. So mm -hmm. our relationship kind of grew from there. And I think that's very rare. Uh, it's usually a fairly combative experience you have with your PhD mm -hmm. advisor because you want to get done soon and they want to get you, they want you to spend more time, you know, on the research. Mm -hmm. uh, but this was very different. This was almost, um, this, this was a loving relationship uh, that, that started off as just an employee employer relationship. And so if nothing else, I think what it did for me, Dana was, was teach me the value of love in business. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. we don't really want to talk about that a lot, but I do think, if you show loving kindness to the people that work for you uh, and work with you, um, you'll build extraordinary trust with them if you're sincere about it. And that's what I learned at that pivoting point between science engineering and leadership. Which is such a gift. You know, I think, uh, and being able to pull, and that he saw, Arthur saw all that in you. How wonderful. What a great relationship you guys have had and continue to have. I love that. And then you yeah. named it your son after him. That's, I did. that's amazing. Amazing. So let's talk about where, you, you know, that got you through college and then on to the next thing of leadership. And then you've had these experiences as leading in all these different um, organizations. Talk to us about what you saw during the pandemic pandemic and what you did and then how you kind of put a, a capsule on what you learned with your book about it. Because I think Certainly. that is powerful. Um, and I do want to spend time on that and where we are right now, because people aren't sure of where we are right now. And you alluded to this in your intro, but it, it, as leaders, it's going to be different. And so I really want to spend some time on that with you, Steve, and, and what, what you learned and what you're sharing with others right now. Well, I think every era... Um, has its own challenges. Um, I was fortunate to sit in the CEO's uh, role um, during 9-11 uh, and then for another company during the financial crisis 2008-2009 and, and then um, into the pandemic, you know, 2020-2022. Uh, and uh, I really took stock of, of what that experience was like. And so uh, I certainly didn't invite those, those crises to come along, yeah. but um, I think the mantle of leadership means you have to perform because people are depending on you. And I think that's key to what I learned during that period of time. Now, the pandemic, I think, took it to another level. I mean, never have we all been in isolation like we were, uh, where there was an existential threat. You know, going to the supermarket felt dangerous. Uh, interacting with the, you know, DoorDash guy seemed dangerous, you know, all things looking back on it were kind of like, you know, mind blowing. 
So none of us, I think, were prepared for the type of isolation. You know, not many of us have been incarcerated. Not many of us have been in a war uh, where the threat of life or death was, was so profound. And I think during the pandemic, we all experienced a part of that. So I think we need to take stock of that's what we all went through together. Mm -hmm. Now, at the time I was CEO of Orshore Technologies, um, we had developed the only FDA approved home test for a infectious disease. Uh, it was for HIV, uh, which was on the market in 2012. And so when the pandemic hit, we were one of the, we were the only company that had experience uh, developing a product for home use. Um, wow. Many others came into play during that time, but I think it became very obvious back in uh, 2020, that we needed home tests to help spread the disease, to help, help stop the spread of the disease. And um, we embarked on a journey, which ultimately led us to triple, quadruple our revenue, double our workforce, and increase our manufacturing by a factor of six during the pandemic. Wow. And we did it all under the circumstances we're all familiar with, which is some people working at home, and the scientists in the laboratories and the manufacturing folks in the factory. So how do you do that? How do you actually pull that off? Um, mm -hmm. and, and the profound lesson to me was it's about trust. Um, mm -hmm. And I have a, because uh, I'm a scientist, I have a formula for trust, which I'll share with of you. Course. I love it, please share. So to me, trust is equal to um, uh, intimacy, uh, times credibility divided by risk. So I'll, I'll break it down. Okay. So, so credibility means um, I trust you because you do what you say you're going to do. In other words, you set lofty goals and I trust you to meet them. Intimacy is different. Intimacy means I trust you because I know you have my back. In other words, I know you care about me. All right, that's different mm -hmm. than I trust you because I know you say you're going to do what you do and can meet goals or meet your number or your sales target, whatever the case may be. And then that's amplified by how risky the situation is. So you can imagine the only way for a company to transform itself during the pandemic like Orshore did was to nurture day-to-day -day high trust with everybody, between everybody. Uh, and we didn't have the normal tools available to us. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. before the pandemic, we said you can only trust people when you meet with them and you look them in the eye, right? Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even right now, Dana, as I'm talking yeah. to you, I'm not looking you in the eye. I'm looking, I'm looking at you on, the, in, screen. on the screen, right? Yeah. I'm not looking at the camera because then I would just be looking at a camera. I, I, I need right. to see you as a human being. Um, right. so, so I think that experience in working with people and asking them to do things they've never done before um, was a test for all of us. That's why I named the book a test for our time, crisis leadership in the next normal. It was a test for all of us. And we also developed this amazing test called IntelliSwab, which Oprah has called the easiest test to use of its kind for COVID. It was a test for all leaders. And it was a test for me personally. And, and all those things are, uh, spoken for in the, in the book that I wrote. Um, and I wrote it mainly because I thought we should learn something from the pandemic, all of us. What? What do you want when people read that book? What are some takeaways you want them to take away? I love the trust formula. I think that's awesome because trust is the number one thing we hear in the workplace right now. Yes. And so when you think about when you wrote that book and you are such a servant leader, I feel your heart. I feel what you're doing um, to make a difference in the world. What do you hope that people, when they pick that up, will learn from it and take away and use as a leader? Well, there are many things. I think what, what folks have told me that have read the book, uh, it's been out for about a year now, um, is uh, there's many things in the experience of living through the pandemic that people can identify with. Okay, mm -hmm. I think the main leadership lesson is leaders need to lead with vulnerability. Um, and so I, I share in the book, um, we sent out emails, I sent out emails every week called the Monday Motivational Message, uh, which started off to be kind of company newsletter-ish, mm -hmm. but then it really got down to the real situation. You know, I shared with them what we knew and what we didn't know about the pandemic, why we were determined to keep them safe, why we would never put them in a situation to compromise their health or well-being and, the, and those of their family. Um, it, was, it was ensuring them that I had their back. 
the intimacy part of the trust formula. Mm-hmm. Um, the credibility side, I, I think I admitted my mistakes in the book and along the way. Um, you know, this was a mm-hmm. profoundly difficult project to get IntelliSwap invented, manufactured, marketed, distributed, all those things under the pandemic conditions. I made a lot of mistakes uh, along the way. So sharing that with folks, I think, um, gives them a sense of humanity that their leader understands Mm -hmm. that's what he's asking them to do is extraordinary and that it's not perfect, but that it's good enough. And together that good enough can make a difference. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I hope it's all those things when we get, when any of us finds ourselves deep in despair or at the edge of hopelessness. Maybe that book will serve as uh, an uplifting message that extraordinary things can get done. Uh, and they'll get done when we all work together and pull together. And to do so, we have to work that trust formula. Credibility, intimacy, divided by risk. I think that is a great formula. During the pandemic, one of the things that helped me was research that Gallup had done on what followers need from their leaders. And you just exemplified all of that because they look for hope and passion which you talked about the heart you know i feel for you we're going to keep you safe the trust and the stability you know i don't the stability is i don't know what's going on but you can or trust i don't know what's going on but you can know that i will tell you as i know um and you you exemplified all of that in your and how you talked about the trust formula and building that trust during that time how long did it take you guys to have to to, because you'd already done a home test, right? And but you had to kind of create something from you know people in in this pandemic situation, get them to to develop something new and then get it on yes. the market and then test it. How long did it take from start to finish? Well, um, first of all, I don't want to give you the impression that that I put on a Superman cape and did this on my own. This were this was no. many people uh, right. chiming in. You know the the the, the prevailing. Um, leadership style that we had throughout the organization was empowerment and accountability. So there were mm-hmm. a lot of people who were empowered to make decisions. So this all started um, in March. Um, remember, we all went into lockdown on mm-hmm. March 13th, right? Mm-hmm. Probably about two weeks later, my chief scientific officer, uh, Jody Berry, came to me and said, Steve, I think we can make this test. Uh, we've done the research. We've, we've done some preliminary uh, experiments in the lab, I think we could do this. So it was my trust in him uh, that enables to get started. So Jody immediately uh, applied for a um, $600,000 grant from uh, an organization called BARDA, which is part of the Department of Health and Human Services in Washington. And within three months, he came up with a prototype. And from there, um, the rest of it was in development and in clinical trials, manufacturing scale up. And so we took that investment of $600,000 from the government and we parlayed that into over $600 million of government funding. So this all happened over the course of about two years time uh, in start to finish. Um, so I think all of us look back at amazement of, of how we did that. You know, we actually had to build new uh, facilities, we had to get new equipment, we had to commission it, we had to hire lots of talented people along the way. So, um, I just, I think that there was a, mo- a momentum of, uh, of caring and problem solving. You know, there were times where, where we were stuck um, and weren't sure we were going to get to the finish line, and one of us sometimes me would say something like, gosh, I wish there were a company developing a, a easy to use home test for COVID to get us out of this pandemic. You know, so it became <laughs> kind of an inside joke of, you know, if not us, who? Why not? If not, yeah. if not, if not when, um, you know, if not now, when? And, and so mm-hmm. we, we operated with that levity, but also the seriousness of what we're doing. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, in, in some sense, it, it felt like what you see in science fiction movies where, you know, the, the, the movie The Martian, which I, I chronicle mm-hmm. in the book a bit, you know, um, how individually we each try to do extraordinary things and uh, try to help each other from our remote pods, you know, our home offices or mm-hmm. uh, where people were in factories or labs. 
And, you know, my, my role was to try to orchestrate them and uh, make them feel like they were all contributing to the cause, which they, they were. What a great feeling. What was that like when y'all finished, got it to market, got it out? How did you celebrate? How did you, or did you go on to the next thing, which so well, many teams do, right? <laughs> they, well, they keep moving. <laughs> so um, it didn't end well for me. I left the company in 2022, and you can read more okay. about that in the book. Um, okay. But but the, the, the moment of triumph for all of us was June 6, um, 2021. And that's the day we got FDA clearance, uh, which wow. is what you need to be able to sell your product. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Jody Berry, I mentioned before, uh, reported to uh, Lisa Nybauer, who was the, the president of the diagnostics division. If there was the sweetest part of this story is that um, June 6 is Lisa's birthday. So she, so, so she she not only guided the company to that point of FDA clearance, but she did it on her birthday, which I think is poetic justice for all of her leadership as well. So, um, you great. know, we found so we found ways to celebrate each other and celebrate our accomplishment. Mm -hmm. um, and amazing. you know, sometimes sometimes the universe hands you those synchronous events, and I think uh, it's worth paying attention to. And they're just bringing out the human side of it. Her birthday on that day, and how you know her amazing leadership during that time to make that happen. Exactly. And looking back, it's kind of like I just got back from Egypt. I'm still processing everything I learned there. It's going to take me a while to process. Same thing going through what yes. you just developed and did, and then how you've gone on to help other leaders now and working serving on boards. So where are we now in the culture? Where are we now with leadership? Where do you see it? Because I think that is the fascinating, really, discussion as we get to look a little, you know, nod to the past. Now, where are we today with leadership? Well, I think that we have to acknowledge that hybrid work is here to stay in some way, shape, or form. And to me, this requires a new look at leadership uh, and the skills needed to become an effective leader in a hybrid environment. Um, and I think that's going to be transformative because I think I don't think we've done it intentionally. I think we've done it by accident because the pandemic required us to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I'm looking for are the extraordinary companies with the extraordinary leaders to use this to their advantage, to say mm -hmm. we are going to become the best company to lead hybrid work because we understand that the skill sets that leaders need to, to thrive under this environment are X, Y, and Z. Okay, and I don't think any company has come up with that X, Y, and Z yet. They're kind of, you know, dragging through it and hoping what they saw in people before the pandemic somehow is related to the hybrid environment. So I don't think it's been intentional at all. And I think that companies that will master that will have better tools, better technology, and better ways of connecting with people, even though, not, even though those people aren't in front of them day to day. So I think that's going to take diagnostics like Clifton Strength Finders to another level. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to take, you know, Hogan assessments to a different level. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we need to account for it much better. So what does it mean for, for in-person work? Well, I think in-person work is where you begin to, you know, uh, uh, nurture the culture and the bond and connection you have with people uh, that is outside of what you do on a Zoom screen day by day. Mm -hmm. I think one of the most profound things we can do, Dana, is be very conscious about what what uh, the need for meetings. I think there are way mm. too many meetings. Bef there were way too many meetings before the pandemic. During the pandemic, it seemed like the only thing we did was have meetings. I mean, people doing what you and I are doing right now, sitting in the yeah. same spot for eight hours at a time, it was exhausting. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's exhausting to have that kind of presence without any break during the day. And then at the end of the day, the people that were in all those meetings have to do the work they didn't do while they were in the meetings. So, right. so that vicious cycle created burnout for folks, and I think it's still going on. So I think part of the resistance you see to folks coming back into the office full time is that folks like the flexibility. They like being able to manage their own productivity. I think it's, it's, it's um, rather much a myth that people are less productive when they work at home. I think the truly dedicated people are actually more productive, but it tends them to burn out more quickly because there's no... Um, sort of modulator to the work and the, the effort and the hours that they put in. 
So these are all things that leaders need to better appreciate to bring out the best in people that we haven't even begun to begin exploring yet. Um, and so that's the challenge, I think, going forward. I agree. I saw a couple posting this morning where people had left their jobs because their company wasn't going hybrid. Um, and so you've got that attrition issue. You've also got the issue with the leaders in the middle management row trying to manage up and manage in and the new. So we've got a lot of that going on right now. Right. And then, and then it, you, I think really what I loved that you just said was high performing individuals who you don't have to check on. You don't have to, they're going to come in and do the work. What we have to manage with them is how they manage their well being. What does yes. well being look like in the workplace? Yes. And how does that, I had talked to a gal yesterday who's creating a new space for herself. She was a high leader in a amazing company and got off the merry-go-round and has transforming, gave herself permission to transform so that she can be in this season of life in a different role and not take on so much. And I think it's that transformation that we have to know as individuals where we are in life and where we are in this yes. crazy, crazy time. Yes. And all those models that we grew up with are gone. <laughs> it's just like, yes. work hard from eight to 10 or, you know, do this, be here, be there. I agree. It's different. So, you know, I, it, yeah, I, 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 I fully, fully agree with that. You know, one of the anthems of my book is lead whole people wholeheartedly. Mm. So what do I, so what do I mean by lead whole people? Um, what we learned from the pandemic was you couldn't really um, separate your employees work for during the day from their home life and their life overall. Those were the people mm. you were leading. So let's acknowledge that we have whole people working mm -hmm. for us, not not people that are punching clocks that right. that you own from nine to five. It's you own their whole existence, everything that's going on with them, uh, their life struggles, um, you know, finding daycare, caring for elderly parents. Those are all part of who they are. We need to account for that. The leading people wholeheartedly is about acknowledging that they are whole beings and leading them through my, their minds, their bodies, their spirits, those are all dimensions that have to be accounted for. Um, and encouraging them to have mind, body, spirit, uh, awareness of their own mm -hmm. and nurturing that in others. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it used to be, oh, you know, we can't talk about spirituality or religion in the workplace, right? Because, mm -hmm. you, know, um, you know, we don't want to run afoul of HR practices. But what's the reality? Those are things that sustain people. Those are the things that they're difference makers in people's lives. So why shouldn't leaders acknowledge that and nurture that and encourage people to explore that for their own? I mean, I'm not going to insist that you, you know, practice my religion or my spirituality. Right. I'm going to encourage you to do it in your own way so that you bring the best person possible into the work setting, whether the work setting is the screen or the work setting is actually in person. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's the breakthrough. I'm looking for companies that embrace that approach, uh, that philosophy, uh, that sense of wholeness and leading whole people or leading whole people wholeheartedly. I think that's going to be the difference maker. I love that. And I think that is being that agile leader right now. And as you said earlier, really knowing yourself well so you can serve well and, and, and knowing each of your people. And they all need something different, right? During yes. during unusual times. So, so this has been so. I loved having the sneak peek, kind of behind the curtain of what it was like to develop a product during the during the pandemic and leading people and how you memorialize that with your book. Um, anything else, Steve, that's coming up for you that I didn't ask, or as we leave in a few minutes, um, some words of wisdom with our leaders that are listening, anything that's coming up that you want to share with the audience? And then we'll also let them know how to get in touch with you. Certainly. Well, I am a student of how intergenerational relationships are going to be important uh, mm. for us all to solve some very uh, difficult issues, you know, whether it's related to the climate or population changes or pandemics. Um, or health and wellness, higher education, all these very profound challenges uh, that we face today. 
I think we need the wisdom of, of folks that have, you know, lived a longer time uh, mm -hmm. to connect with um, folks that are just starting out in their careers more than ever. Um, and I think that sort of distance that I grew up in, which is, you know, you'll get the wisdom of the CEO when you sort of climb your way up the ladder to, to his mm -hmm. level. That can't happen. We need to be much more approachable mm -hmm. as, as modern elders and as leaders. Uh, and we need to invite uh, connection, um, mentorship uh, with the younger generation of leaders. And ultimately, I think we have to empower them much earlier in their careers than when we were empowered. Uh, the challenges that we face today, I think, are that profound. So somehow we need to transcend um, the developments of technology um, with the profound wisdom of living through many different life experiences, including the pandemic, uh, that, have bring, that have been brought to us. I love that. And I think that puts a bow on your empowerment and accountability, um, empowering each generation, because we're going to have like five generations in the workplace right now, yes. and they all need something different. Yeah. But how, what a great statement to learn from your 96 year old, or is he 96? That you're mentoring. Going on 97, yeah. yeah. 97 to mentoring the 20 year olds out there um, yes. that somebody came along and mentored you. So, wow, Stephen, this has been so um, life giving. Thank you for sharing your heart as a leader. You, your heart really shows through. And thank the you. humanness of leadership. So thank you for what you're doing right now. Thank you for your leadership. Can you share with the audience the best way to reach you? I think you have a website that they can reach out to you on. You can reach me uh, through LinkedIn, or you can reach me at my website, which is www.tang.ceo. Awesome. Love it. Thank you so much. It was so full of wisdom today. I've got to my go pleasure. back and process everything you said now. Thank you, so Dana. Thank you so much. Thank thanks, you. Thanks for all you do. Okay. I appreciate it. We sure. You have been listening to Dominate Your Day podcast. If you're ready to transform your life and workplace from the inside out, go to DanaWilliamsCo.com and set up a discovery call. We would love to connect with you and equip you with some helpful resources. Thank you for listening today, and please take a moment to subscribe to Dominate Your Day wherever you listen.